Hi, everyone, and welcome to the Local Homeschoolers Podcast, where you come for local resources and encouragement. I am your host, Autumn Frisbee. Welcome to the show. Today, we have Sophie on the podcast. Sophie is a local Palm Beach County homeschool parent and a professional educator by trade of 20 years working in public and private institutions. Currently, she um, owns and operates a homeschool pod in the West Palm Beach area. I'm looking forward to her sharing her story and what inspired your drive and passion for home education. So welcome to the show. Hi, thanks for having me. So do you want to tell the listeners just a little bit about your background, your education, your past experience working in education? Yeah, sure. Um, well, it all started 20 years ago, just about. Um, I always knew I wanted to do something that would leave a mark on, on this world. And initially, I actually pursued a career in political science because I thought being a politician was a way to do that. And um, I quickly found out that actually was not the way for me. And so I figured, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to mold young minds. And I'm going to, and I, you know, committed myself to learning of about education and how to do that. And so I, you know, went to school and I actually majored in psychology because I wanted to understand the human mind and uh, the brain development. And then I learned the educational practices through my jobs at um, different uh, schools. So my journey began at a Montessori school where I started with two-year-olds and three-year-olds. And then from there, I went to a private school. And in that time, I got pregnant and uh everything just really changed. I became really, really immersed in learning about brain development and early childhood. And just my goal was to make my baby the little Einstein, the the baby that I wanted him to be. And I played the classical music and I did the flashcards when he was a baby and we did baby sign language. And when it was time to find a school for him, I found that none of the schools that were out there were up to my uh, expectations. Um, But luckily, I did find a great, great private school called Ideal Elementary. And I toured that place and having known what I known about brain development and education research, and knowing what I wanted for my son, I knew that was a place for him. So I begged, begged them to please give me a job. I didn't even have my degree at this point. And I, I, you know, I offered to sweep floors or whatever, just so that he could go there. And they did. Uh, They gave me that opportunity. And it was where I got my start and my foundation. And um, it worked very, very well. But unfortunately, the baby Einstein that I was hoping to create, life had something else in mind for me. Uh, It came to light when my son was about uh, in first grade that he had dyslexia. And I knew that something was amiss because given all of the things that I had been doing for him, the reading not being there was, it was a red flag. And so initially that hit me so hard. I, uh, I didn't know if it was my fault, if I didn't do enough, uh, why this was happening. You know, I, typical uh, things I think a lot of parents go through when they get um, news about their child that is, is not really what they wanted to hear, you know. And so, of course, once again, I started to immerse myself in learning everything I could about Uh, education for dyslexic children and and maybe children with special needs. And in that experience, I came to find out that uh, a traditional approach of education, as most schools are, it just, it wasn't working for my son. And so it was at that moment that I decided to open my own school and make it a homeschool learning center and open it up to other children that also just didn't, you know, fit within the traditional box of education as it has been designed for what since the late 1800s and that was in 2011 and since then I have been uh, running owning and operating my own uh, school and now pod out of my house and it's been fantastic. That's great so even in 2011 you noticed there was a need for alternative education in our area Um, and you stepped up and how was um, the response of the community for that? Well, back in that year, it was our school and I believe Space of Mind were the only homeschool hybrid schools like ours in the sense that it was project-based learning. It was very um, hands-on. It was just completely different than anything else that was out there at the time. And initially, 
we had a following because we had a clientele base already um, from being known in the community. Um, but it was scary. If I'm being honest, I was scared because I didn't know. Because when you choose to take a path that's so different from the traditional uh, road, you don't know. So that first couple, the for those first couple of years, I wondered, are we doing the best thing for the children? Are we, are we really preparing them for the the world that they're going to come into? Um, because in our program, there were no tests, there were no grades, there were no textbooks. It was really uh, learning through projects and l- allowing the child's curiosity to lead and guide us and l- allow them to be the leaders in their learning. And so you see a lot of that more in the younger grades in preschool in the Montessori approach and the Reggio Emilia approach, but you don't see it too often in the older grades and especially not back then. But we did it because uh, we knew there was a research that supported it. We um, did a lot of professional development class and learned very, very well how to incorporate this and keep the academic rigor while at the same time allowing for that voice and choice of the child. And as one year turned to two, which turned to five, which turned to seven, our little ones started to get into high school and college. And that first class that I started with, those children, that very first year ended up going to FAU High, one of my students was. So graduated with a bachelor's degree by the time she was 17. We had children go on to a Benjamin and St. Andrews and American Heritage and then on to Purdue University and NYU and all of these real top tier schools in our area and colleges. And they, they thrived. And they, they did that because of obviously the people that they are, but I'd like to believe that um, their time with us and learning how to collaborate and communicate and work and learn through projects and solve problems helped them with that. Because they definitely didn't come from an environment where it was sitting in rows and columns and, and open your book, we're going to do chapter one, and now we're going to move on to chapter two. But wait, I didn't understand chapter one, and it doesn't matter. we got to keep going. Objectives are on the wall. We've got to – it's – it was different. And so as the years went on and I saw the successes of our students of all varieties, I, more and more was I solidified and yep, this, this is the thing that we're doing and this is good. And now, you know, we fast forward to 2022 and there are so many micro schools that do hands-on learning and project-based learning and um, student-led learning. It has many different names. Um, But it's all that kind of same idea where we, you know, that break of the norm and, and the children are thriving and they're growing. And best of all is that they're being children again. And I think a lot of what's been lost in traditional schooling is this, we're so, they're so focused on, on testing and assessments and objectives and benchmarks and all of these that they are really have forgotten to just allow children to be children and the importance of play and the importance of downtime, of, of having a break in between those, those hard thinking times. And, and I feel for these kids because I do still tutor children in uh, private and public school and, and I see the stress and the anxiety that they have to live with. And it breaks my heart, honestly. Right. And so the pandemic really has probably given you that extra boost of confidence, knowing that you are kind of going in the right direction. Not that you maybe needed that, but now that there's more pods opening, micro schools, I think families are more apt to say there's got to be another way. Yes, definitely. The pandemic, that is a great silver lining of this pandemic. I mean, obviously it's been, it's been rough on everyone and the education system and just people in general, but it, I, the silver lining has been that it has opened a lot of families' eyes to, to different ways, to seeing that it doesn't have to be this cookie-cutter format because education isn't one size fits all. And even within families, what works for one child may not work for another. So now that there are so many pods and homeschool hybrid programs and co-ops and even you know private schools, uh, choice programs, there's something for everyone. And it's just a matter of, of doing your due diligence, your research, and going out there and finding what is the best fit for your child. And what has been the response for pa- parents and families that you've known that are just homeschooling only because COVID happened 
And now they're kind of searching, they're thinking, you know, outside of the box. Well, you know what I've noticed? Two things. One, the families that have chosen to homeschool that are doing this uh, pandemic necessary, if you will, I find there's a divide, right? So the they're trying to approach it in the same way that the traditional schools approached it. And I think they're beginning to see the difficulties that that entails at home when they're the ones that have to, you know, teach their child and they're trying to follow the model that they know because that's the model that I'm I know I grew up in a public school um, and the only reason I know other methods is because I've made it a, my life's mission to learn these other techniques and methods but for you know a person that's just trying to do right by their child they're going to try to follow that mold and so I think in trying to follow that mold they've discovered a, it's not easy, and B, there's a lot of uh, frustration and stress, and it's it's dif- it's been difficult for some. And so I see the old school homeschooling parents, like those of us that have been doing this for decades now, um, open and embrace the new homeschool parents with such loving patience. And hey, it's okay. They don't have to do this next chapter. Hey, it's okay. Let them go play outside. And then just trying to get them to, you know, take a breath, take a step back and, and breathe and say, it's okay. You know, we don't have to follow this mold. We are going to, we're going to break the mold. And so what I'm finding with some of some parents is after they've began, begun their homeschooling process, they either, Uh, assimilate to it, love it and keep it going or, you know, settle in with, I want this for my child, but I'm not the one to do this for my child. And that's where pods and micro schools and hybrids come in because they offer those parents the best of both worlds. And I'd like to consider what I do here at my pod. I, I always like to say it's a private school education with a homeschool vibe. So you, you are going to get uh, the academics and the rigor and the push that's at your child's level and um, at their pace because every child, you know, learns at a different pace, is at a different level, so on and so on. But you're also going to get the homeschool vibe of we're going to, you know, focus for 20 minutes and we're going to have creative play for five. Then we're going to focus and play and have that balance. We're going to go on field trips. We're going to garden. We're going to, you know, get messy with art. We're going to be involved in the community. So it's really the best of both worlds. And so for the families that have just started homeschooling, I, I see from this, this two tracks, the ones that are all in it and want to keep it going and the ones that want it, but don't want to do it themselves. Yeah, there's a lot of um, new homeschool parents, I feel, that are struggling with the, um, you know, the less traditional way. And I feel, and they're pushing traditional schooling at home. And I know from my experience as well, that's just not going to work for most kids um, in the home environment. So um, the ability to find what works for your child is also the great thing about homeschooling. And it takes time as well. Yeah, because it's um, some children will happily sit and read a chapter book and uh, summarize the chapters or go through a workbook and take the test and they're happy and they're growing and that works for them. But I would say for a majority of children, that style doesn't work. And what we have to keep in mind, and I think even our, our larger, greater education system hasn't quite embraced fully is that the children of the 21st century are growing up with a real advanced technology that a lot of them before the age of three are navigating iPads and computers and touchscreens or whatever. And that's changing their brain development. That's making it so they need this instant feedback, this change. They need those kind of things to keep them stimulated and engaged. And for a lot of children, the old school method is just not stimulating and engaging enough. So instead, what families are, are encountering is pushback or breaking down or um, acting out or those kind of things. And, and they're wondering, what am I doing wrong? You know, and it's not anything that they're doing wrong per se, but it's just like you said, it's you got to find that right fit for your child. And that's where I'm so proud to be a part of this homeschool community that uh, Palm Beach County has because the, um, 
homeschoolers here are so good at sharing their information and advice to newcomers and helping them to take a breath and, and relax and say, it's going to be okay. We just, you know, it's a learning curve. And just like it's frustrating when your child's learning something new, you have to give yourself that learning curve time to know that you're learning something new too. So about the system in general, um, you know, public school, private school, what are your thoughts on the differences there? For the most part, the public schools and the private schools are two sides of the same coin. Um, That's not to say there aren't great public school programs and there's not to say there aren't amazing private school programs. But for the most part, the majority of both of those are your rooted in tradition. They're rooted in, we've got a scope and sequence for the school year, for the grade, and we are going to cover X amount of objectives, and we are just going to mull through this whether your child gets it or not, because we have to be at a certain page at a certain point by the end of the year. And as a parent, you just have to kind of take a step back. You know your child better than anyone else, and ask yourself, is that the method that's best for my child? Some children are a bit more uh, creative. Some children need to move more. And if you put them in a situation where they have to sit in a chair for six hours a day with minimal movement in between, that's not honoring who your child is and what they need. If you have this creative child that thinks outside of the box and wants to um, build or draw or get messy with art and you're putting them in a situation where they have to write on lines and stay inside boxes and everything's really rigid. Well, again, you're not honoring who your child is. And that puts the person in a situation or the child in a situation where they may feel frustrated, lost, upset, stressed, or any of those things. And it can cause this whole big effect. So My short answer would be those private school and and public school are two sides of the same coin, but there are some good ones out there. There are some gems. It's just a matter of finding what works for your child. Yeah. And every child is different. I know I say that probably on every podcast, but it is true because even in the same family, they're going to differ in what works for one and what works for the other. So, um, and homeschooling really gives you a great idea of how your children learn (laughs) on a whole new level. Um, So what is your, you've been involved in the homeschool area and um, public school and private school education. What is your vision kind of for education and where do you see that it needs to go from here? I would love to see education take a step back. If I'm talking about the way it's designed in the traditional sense in the public and private school sector, I think that what they need to do in that sector is take a step back and bring in, bring back the arts, bring back music, bring back play. Um, They've sacrificed a lot of those, what they consider extracurriculars to this, for the sole focus of uh, assessment, you know, those testing uh, subjects, the reading and the math and science and social studies. And those things are all great, but you can always implement reading, math, social studies, and science, even when the children are at play. When they're doing music, That's a math lesson. When they're gardening or or they're outside or they're just appreciating nature, there's science there. There's history there. So it's just a matter of learning how to incorporate a bigger, uh, larger environment for them and get those things that you need in the objectives within it. That's what I would like to see in that area. I don't know if it's going to happen. Um, my guess is that they're just going to become more computerized and more game-based um, because that seems to be the way it's going. And again, that may work for some children, but um, because we're in this era of technology and children having devices from a very young age, I think it's important to give them an opportunity to disconnect, you know, to to get away from those devices for a few hours and learn in different ways. Yeah. And just um, the opportunity of being out in nature really does help people, especially if they're having problems in school. Um, Even if you just need a break in the day, I've noticed for my own kids, like, let's just go outside and um, get some fresh air. So I really do hope that that happens with um, schools that they can get more creative, creative ways to educate. 
Yes. And it's not just children. I mean, even think about us as adults when we are in a heightened mode of stress or anxiety or whatever, going outside, taking a walk, just being outside, there is something to that, like connecting with nature. It kind of resets and reprograms. And and we know there's research that supports that, be how being in nature lowers your stress and increases your endorphins and all those good things. And yet we've taken that away from our children. When I look at my my elementary school that I went to, it used to be a huge field that we would run and play, and there was so many different things that we could do outside. And now when I drive by that school, they've consumed mm-hmm. that field with more buildings. And it's it saddens me because I'm like, the buildings, the school buildings themselves look almost like jail cells. And And childhood is so short. And... To think that that's where we're sending our children to them for them to spend a majority of their day and they're not being allowed to kind of have those opportunities, it's, it's kind of sad. So that's where homeschooling to me is the way to go because it really does give you that flexibility to practice those things that we know are good for all people, not just children. And also it does, it does help with the brain development in the sense of... So I'm going back to public school and traditional school. The typical method is going to be we're going to read about whatever topic, you know, we're supposed to do for this week. I'm going to, me, the teacher, impart this information on you for this amount of days. And at the end of set days, we're going to take a test. And I'm going to see how much of that information, you know, stuck in your brain. And in that design, it's really like um, you can envision it like, a person pouring water into the cup. And then I'm uh, the teacher is the one that pours the water into the cup. But when you take that away and you allow the child to even, let's say, play outside and they're putting their hands in the dirt and they uncover some beetles and they notice, hey, there's beetles digging around the dirt. And they ask these questions. Now their minds, you're not the one filling that cup. Their minds are the ones that are saying, hey, well, what is this? They're opening their own cup up to be filled. They're asking. They're doing it themselves. They're making the connections. Mm-hmm. They're synthesizing this information. It's organic. Their interest is high. Their curiosity is high. And then it sticks. So without the need of, of you know, these strict parameters or whatever, um, their learning is organic. And it's learning that sticks. And that's one thing I've noticed in in my homeschooling experience and the way that I do things with my students is we don't cover as many topics as a traditional school does in one school year. We cover a lot less, but the things that we cover stick because of the way we cover it. So then the following year, when we get a whole new set of topics, we just build on from the things that we already learn. And when my kids go on into their high schools and and colleges and beyond, all of that learning was the way, because it was learned so differently and so organically and it really stuck there, they're able to apply it to different things. And what I see with a lot of the kids that I tutor that go to private and public school is it nothing sticks. Even if they're getting these A's on their test and their GPA says that they're very smart and they're doing very well, if you ask them a couple months later about something they learn, a lot of times they cannot tell you what it is. They just don't remember it. And wouldn't you consider that kind of like a false sense of learning? Right. It's just more schooling versus educating them as a way that they're a natural learner when they really, truly want to uh, be taught how to learn. I mean, they already know how to learn, but the natural way of learning is easier when they know how to do it themselves. Yeah. And this other, yeah. And this way it's just regurgitating. And when they get older, they just get really good at finding the answers and it's not learning. It's, it's learning how to find answers. It's learning how to, uh, you know, put something together real quick to get that good grade. But what did you learn about, about yourself? Really? What did you learn about how things work? What did you, you know, those, all of those things only come when you are, freed from the shackles that the restrictions of traditional learning puts on you. And really teaching them how to critically think about things so that they can figure out things on their own. Mm -hmm. That's a big piece that's missing. Yeah. And I think about a good piece of evidence for that to like kind of show how, how that works, not how that works, but show 
that it w works is if you think about like the most brilliant minds in history, um, if you think about our um, Teslas and our Isaac Newtons and uh, Leonardo da Vinci's, none of these people went mm -hmm. to a traditional school. They really um, learned by being out, by um, exploring, by observing. Observational skills are huge and rarely taught in, in traditional schools. Whereas a homeschooler, you can just sit and observe something because even early humans, all the things that we as humans have been able to accomplish usually has come from our observation, our questioning, our testing. And we can't give that to our children if everything is so mm -hmm. prescribed and rigid. Right. That's great advice. Um, let's move a little bit in the direction of your pod. If there's a parent out there who's frustrated and looking for a place you know, to have their student or even open their own pod, could you describe a little bit about how, what it took to open your pod? Well, I, um, I actually committed my, my, the entire living space of my house to this pod. Uh, the only space that I have left really to live in is my room, which has my bed in it, my TV. Um, and I know most parents are not like wacky like me and to do all that. <laughs> so, um, at, at the very, at the very least, a space where the child, it is the child space. So if they want to put something up on the wall, they can. Uh, and the reason I say that is because visual, like to put the things on the wall that they can refer back to, things that they can feel proud of or look back on as something that I'm a learning in progress. It, you know, you've got to make it their space. Again, taking away that rigidity of, no, we're only going to have this and you can't touch this. And, you know, it's got to be their space. Um, so I would say that you could start with that if you were going to start a pod. And um, get to know your children first before you commit to any set curriculum. I don't know if there's any homeschool or new homeschooling parents out there, but I would imagine that maybe a few of them bought this, bought certain sets of curriculum and then came to find out it just didn't work for their child or for themselves. Yes. So I would say, go ahead and spend that first uh, few weeks, month, whatever it is, just getting to know your child, how they learn, what excites them, what does it, and then you can find and design a curriculum to meet that. Because it's easy to go online and see what should, uh, what are the second grade standards? That's information that's out there. And you see what the standards are. You see what your child uh, enjoys or how they learn best, at what time do they learn best, because different children have different times of the day that they're on peak and not on peak, and then build your school program around that. When you have a pod, it's, it's a bit trickier because you have children different ages that are working on different things, but you can always level it. You can always level a lesson uh, to meet your your oldest or your more advanced students and your youngest or developing students. Okay, that's great. And then how did you go about fin finding your families for the pod? Oh, I, because I had the school, um, I own the Global Perspective School in downtown. When we had to go online because of uh, the corona apocalypse, <laughs> our youngest in our elementary school, those parents were the ones that said, hey, we don't want our kids to be online. We we signed up for a project-based learning school, and that's what we want. And so that's when I was like, great, bring them to my house. And then I changed my whole house to look like a school, and we continued on. So I already came uh, or started my pod at my house with a set of children that were already my students. But the new children came in through just Facebook posts because I, I don't have a website currently for my pod or anything out there. It's all word of mouth. And, and I like that. I love to encourage my parents to talk to other parents and share with them, you know, what they like as well as what they don't like. And that's another thing with that a pod gives the parent. In, at least in my pod, I just like I allow my students voice and choice, I absolutely have par parental voice and choice too. I want to know what the parents' goals are, what they want for their children. And I will always take um, suggestions for curriculum or activities or field trips or whatever, because at the end of the day, we are a village. Mm -hmm. And that's what I tell all my parents. Like, I'm just, you are contracting me to be a part of your village. So I want, we work in partnership 
and and it's been a beautiful thing. Our little pod of parents and children, we're growing together and learning together, mm-hmm. and it's really beautiful. That is so cool, Sophie. I really appreciate yeah. um, you coming on and just sharing your passion. Um, overtaking your house, that's passion right there. Um, <laughs> and just opening up you know, your story to homeschoolers in our area. I really feel like the most important thing is to network and to get on Facebook, join homeschool groups, and see yes. what works for you and your family first. And know if you feel like if you got to that point and you feel like I can't do this, it's okay. You don't have to. There are people out there, people like me, people like Cheryl, people like all these uh, homeschool hybrid micro schools that will do it for you and will do it with you. And so I would say to those parents that are struggling, like don't give up the idea of homeschool, just find the program that best suits your needs. There's different schedules, there's different everything, but there's something for everyone. Yeah, and it can change from year to year. You know, not everyone does the same thing year after year. And that is the good thing about the homeschooling community. There's so many different options and resources here, so. And, yeah. and yours is one of them. But so. yeah, Facebook is a, is a gold mine for information and help and that um, homeschooling groups that are on there. There's so many of them. They're really, really wonderful. We're so blessed to be in Palm Beach County. I mean, we really do have a very strong homeschooling network. We do. So, well, Sophie, I appreciate your time today. And I look forward to this podcast encouraging any parent out there who's looking for a little bit of push into homeschooling or just a little bit of um, courage. Thank you for tuning in to the Local Homeschoolers podcast. If you would like to share your homeschool story or have a local Palm Beach County resource that you would like to share on the podcast, please reach out to us at localhomeschoolers.com.